Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's so great to see all of your faces and some of your screens. Um, thanks so much. And um, thanks to Rachel and Michael Weiss uh, for joining us today from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, we're going to get into um, talking about her work today, and I'm so excited to hear what she has to say. Um, behind me is also her artwork. So um, get a little preview before we get fully into it. Um, so just a kind of brief thing. I have you all on mute right now, um, but if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourselves at any point um, and yeah, join the conversation. Um, again, my name is Michelle Raymond and I'm the director of Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talks at Clark College. And um, this is our first Clark Art Talk um, done virtually and of the school year. So um, it's really exciting. It's a kind of whole new direction and a whole new way of kind of approaching, you know, kind of these art talks. And um, I'm excited to see kind of where it goes. Um, so yeah, we'll get started here in a second. Um, a few things to kind of talk about um, before we introduce Rachel. Um, I wanted to kind of share with you all some exciting programming. Um, we have coming up at Archer Gallery and the Clark Art Talks this year. Um, obviously we have Rachel today. She is one of nine of our Clark Art Talks that we'll have uh, throughout the whole year. We'll have three total this term, three in winter, and then three again in spring. Um, obviously right now everything's remote, so um, until that changes, everything will be done via Zoom. Um, all the Zoom links for um, the art talks, opening receptions, for exhibitions and things like that are all listed on our website. So everything's kind of moved from a remote, or I'm sorry, from in-person physical, you know, operations to remote operations through our website, which is www.archergallery.space. Um, and right now we have a really fantastic exhibition up. Um, it's called Out of Nothing, and it's by uh, Portland artist Al Allison Provax. Um, so you can go to the website and check it out. It's virtual. Um, there are animated GIFs there um, that you can check out, and there's even an interactive component that you can sign up for and receive um, physical art objects in the mail, which is super cool. And I encur encourage you all to sign up for it. Um, we also have an artist talk again on Friday at noon. So this Friday, October 9th at noon um, with Allison to um, celebrate the opening of her show and to hear her talk about her art and her practice. Um, so again, all those Zoom links are going to be on the website, archergallery.space, um, if you want to join us on Friday. And I'd love to see you all back again if you have time. Um, and then beyond that, uh, we have Laura Kim coming in as um, a solo artist and exhibition um, in November, and that'll continue through February. Um, Laura Kim is a fantastic digital and performance-based artist. Um, she's also a writer and she's based in Boulder, Colorado. So that'll be really, really great um, as well. Uh, we again have nine talks. Um, so we have a few more coming up in the next couple months um, that I'm also really excited about. Um, cool. So uh, with that, I just want to say some thank yous. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, Rachel, obviously, for being here today. Um, such a pleasure seeing you again and catching up um, and working with you. Um, I also want to say thank you to um, ASCC, which is the Associated Students of Clark College, for um, all of your support, especially to Darcy Fighter. I don't know if Dar Darcy's here right now, but she's been such a huge help um, for the Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talks programs. Um, and we wouldn't be here without them um, and the support as well. Thank you to the art department, to Grant Hoddle, who's here today, um, who's the chair of the department. Hi, Grant. Um, and also to um, Sensony Stokes and uh, Lisa Conway, um, Katharina Holsinger. I think I saw Katharina in as well. Um, really fantastic um, to work with you all. And thank you all for your support um, as the director of the gallery. So. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Rachel. Um, so Rachel Micah Weiss, again, is here with us today. She is a fantastic artist and an old peer and friend of mine um, from grad school at the San Francisco Art Institute. Her work is beyond fabulous. I've loved it from the day that I set eyes on it in 2010 when we joined, you know, our grad program together. 
Um, her work is epic in scale and it's both challenging and approachable simultaneously, which as an artist myself, I know that that can be a really difficult challenge and she does it seamlessly. Um, you can see the work and craftsmanship and thought that goes into all of her pieces, which um, we're gonna be going in a little bit of the studio tour after the artist lecture. Um, so uh, we'll get to kind of see it in person, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, and also uh, Rachel's work has been shown all over the world. Um, it's in multiple public collections, including the US Embassy, um, in Kyrgyzstan and Air, Airbnb uh, headquarters in Seattle, um, the Pittsburgh International Airport and De Cordova's uh, Museum um, in Massachusetts. So lots of really fantastic, beautiful collections that she's a part of, solo shows all over the country and um, just a really, really fantastic array of work um, that she's producing. So um, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce her and have her give you all a little bit of an insight into her art practice. Please welcome her, Rachel Michael Weiss. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to Clark College for having me. This is, it's really wonderful to be able to share my work with you and not have to get on a plane. So, uh, I, and I appreciate being the inaugural artist uh, as part of uh, your series of talks. So thank you, Michelle, for having me. So yeah, as Michelle said, I'm gonna start with a slideshow and show you lots of images. Hopefully it'll be nice and fast paced and interesting. Um, and then uh, the beauty of me being able to share my work remotely is that I can share my studio with you here in Pittsburgh. So I'll show you a little bit of the behind the scenes process and sort of physical thinking that goes into making this work uh, and give you all an opportunity to ask questions and be involved uh, after I share some images. So if you'll just give me a moment, I will share my screen and pull up my slideshow. All right, are we good, Michelle? Are we highly visible? Okay. Good to go. Right. Great. Um, so I am I'm going to take you through my practice a little bit today and start really in the beginning, which is when I came to know Michelle in graduate school. And uh, I'll share a variety of work. I'm going to jump back and forth in time a little bit and kind of move conceptually through different projects, which are all loosely sort of related around my primary concern in my practice, which is borders and boundaries and the ways that they can be permeable and malleable and changeable. So we'll, we'll start with me on the town dump in Maine uh, while I was at the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. And uh, you know, at the, at the beginning of my art life as a graduate student, uh, trying to make art with a very slim budget, one had to be resourceful. And I'll sort of talk about different ways in which I've tried to be resourceful as an artist throughout my career, um, even as my situation has changed. Um, so <laughs> here I am searching through the, um, the Deer Isle main dump for materials that fascinated me. We found this uh, old crabbing rope, which had been discarded there. And of course it smelled like rotting fish and we had to drag it out with a pickup truck. And it was in this huge disgusting tangle and I absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, <laughs> and set about washing it and kind of sorting it into different colored piles. And so as I became really fascinated with what objectively other people would say is a pretty disgusting uh, material, rope, um, in this case used crabbing rope, um, I really had to ask myself, you know, what is this material fascination? Why is this material interesting to me? And is that part of the content of the work? And ultimately it was. Um, this is a detailed view of a piece uh, sagging ellipse uh, after Richard Serra. Here is the full view. This is one of the pieces that I made in my graduate program. Um, and uh, you'll see the scale of it momentarily. Um, but, you know, I was really interested in rope from the beginning. And I think the fascination for me, and it continues to be the fascination with much of my materials, is in its inherent function. And I really started to realize that there's a pretty 
ingrained an important vocabulary in the materials that I was working with and I could communicate a lot because we all have these associations with in this case rope right it's a material that's used in shipping it's a material that's used to bind and restrict it's very utilitarian um, and so i started to think about it in this way in this sort of restrictive way as a way to talk about um, you know the sort of architectural boundaries that enclose us and their relationship uh, to the softer boundaries that enclose us like our clothing and that piece was named Sagging Ellipse after Richard Serra. I thought it, I should, it's only fair for me to introduce the, the man himself, uh, Richard Serra, who's been an important influence for me throughout my practice. Uh, these are his torqued ellipses at Dia Beacon in New York, which for me was a really transformative experience. The first time I went in college, it totally blew my mind that you could have these massive art installations that you could enter and in his case, you really have to explore the work from the outside and the inside to fully know it. They're so massive that you can't really take the whole artwork in, in your frame of vision. And that guiding principle of viewer completion of really needing to circumnavigate the work to understand it uh, became really central to my practice. And so uh, with this piece, here it is installed and it was very apt, an old shipping factory. Um, Somart's Cultural Center in San Francisco, which used to be a, a shipbuilding factory. It had these 50 foot high ceilings. Um, and I really wanted to engage those and really speak to the architecture of the space and the weight of this 500 pound rope enclosure. Um, and I'm gonna jump back to the pieces that predated this one a little bit because you can sort of see that I'm using this really physical knotting technique, this weaving technique. Um, and it really started out with weaving on the loom and getting very quickly frustrated with that limiting small format and wanting to kind of supersize the process of weaving. So while I was in graduate school, I built a loom out of some two by fours and scrap wood that I found. And that was the loom that created this piece because of course the standard loom was never gonna be able to allow me to weave with 500 pounds of one inch diameter rope. So jumping back a little bit, um, a piece that predated that one, Absence Presence, this is a human sized piece. And it's funny, I've come back to this piece, I feel like in the pandemic moment that we're in, uh, it, it is. It, it feels very topical to me at this time. Um, but for this work, um, viewers would kneel on these little pillows inside the sculpture and they would look at each other and they'd be separated by about two feet. They wouldn't be able to touch and they'd kind of be forced to engage directly and look with, straight at one another in the face. But of course they can't touch. So it's this simultaneous connection that I'm inviting viewers to have, but also preventing them from having that connection. And that push and pull is really um, part of my work. So this piece was woven on a loom and you can see the detail of the, of the yarn in right here. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, it's a lot of labor. And so I really had to ask myself how important that labor was. One of the things that I struggled with in graduate school was people asking me, oh man, where did you get that beautiful fabric? And I was like, no, I made it. Um, and I really had to ask myself, is that important that people knew that I made it, You know, aside from the fact that I spent hours and hours at the loom weaving it. And I decided that that was important um, at, that, at that time, that the labor, gave some inherent value to the work, but also that I was talking about labor, that I was talking about, you know, these unseen women's hands creating these garments that we wear. I wanted to share this piece just because it's a great segue into the current work that I'm making. And I, I didn't even realize how related it was until I, you know, looked back at it. This piece is from 2011 and it's really related to the work that I created uh, six years later, but um, for this work, I wove wire into the actual material that I wove on the loom so that I could actually get into this sleeping bag structure and form it around my body to create the illusion of this bodily sap, almost like um, a, uh, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, almost like a, um, uh, the, the cloth that one, that one drapes over your face at um, in a funeral. I'm, um, going to, I'll, it'll come to me later. Um, right, but of course it's sitting on this body size coffin-like st structure. 
Um, that's the word I'm looking for. Totally can't think of it. One of you can type it into the chat if you can get my my senile brain rolling. Um, but I really um, recently started looking back at these marble sculptures. Yes, that's marble. It's solid marble that's carved. Um, and you know, this is this is very old, all done with with hand tools. I believe this is uh, you know 1700s. Um, these sculptures by um, largely Italian artists, this one is Antonio uh, Corradini, and really thinking about this illusion between solidity and softness. So that piece that I just showed that was woven was really getting at that, how do I create the illusion of this rigid structure, this Richard Serra-like structure with a material that's soft. And then I started to play with the inverse. How can I create this illusion of softness, of pliability, in this structure that's incredibly rigid. And, you know, in so doing, as you can see in this piece, I mean, it's, it's really mind boggling that you're looking at a solid piece of marble and there is not a translucent veil uh, here. And so I really started playing with this idea or this desire to really catch viewers in their visual assumptions and get them to start thinking and acting uh, differently and really uh, reconsider their entire assumption about materials. So you can see the relationship um, with this work. This is cast concrete, um, one of the first in my fold series. And so I started playing with, um, with this material, concrete, in fluid forms scaled to my body. So these pieces are 66 inches long, that's my height. Um, and so I really was playing with the ways in which they could interact with these coffin-like bodily forms. Um, and they, of course, allude to fabric, that architecture of the body while also really referencing architecture. You know, concrete is ubiquitous in our built environment. So they kind of toe that line. And their sort of polychrome makeup, I think really gets viewers to question what exactly you're looking at. And I wanted these pedestals as well to kind of feel barely there, so they're reflective, uh, so that they, you know, I, I wanted them to kind of transcend the pedestal uh, and become part of the work. So this is how they're made. It's kind of like I throw everything but the kitchen sink at it. Um, I, I have this uh, sort of bag-like mold in the studio, which I can uh, I can show you guys later on our stu studio tour, and I take lava-like concrete while it's dripping wet and kind of drip it into the form. I'll show some process images of that later to create the swirling form. And what you're looking at here is the underside of this piece, right? You can see the relationship. Uh, and so there's really a loss of control that happens here, that hyper-controlled weaving process. It, it's sort of the opposite of that, um, which is great for me because you'll see in my work a, a cleanliness and a tightness, which is a, something I really have to resist. So these works really allow me to lose control because I really don't know what the surface is going to look like until I wait 72 hours and demold it. And then of course, labor again, I had to you know, sand incessantly uh, to get them to that super smooth texture. And as the work has evolved, um, it's really pushed into the figural much more. You know, these, these works and a lot of those that have followed are standing upright, they're leaning against the wall and that verticality really makes them these bodily figural forms. And you can see here as well, this stone, which I'm going to talk about later, like rope, stone has figured pretty heavily in my work because of the symbolism that is loaded into it. Um, you know, in this case, it becomes this burden or maybe the head of the, um, of the piece on the left, um, or maybe a weapon to um, sort of bludgeon the other one. It kind of can move through all of these different associations it's really whatever the viewer projects onto it. And so I'm interested in, in creating these surfaces um, where the viewer can participate and complete the work with whatever they bring to the table. So here's an installation view of that show to give a sense of scale. I mean, these are bodily size. And then I'll show you these, um, I call them bound landscapes, these uh, marble fragments inside cast concrete frames. And I also created for this show something new and different for me, which was this 
site specific wallpaper, which you see on the right, um, there were multiple boulders in this show. And to create this wallpaper, I took really close up photographs of all of these boulders and, you know, 360 images of them and unfolded them and stitched them together in Photoshop. So when you're looking at this, at this wallpaper, from this distance, it feels like a very convincing rocky surface. But as you approach it, you start to see that the colors are all wrong and it's really fuzzy and pixelated. And this solid barrier kind of breaks apart in front of you, which of course is fairly similar to what these concrete marble-like slabs are doing, right? They're, they're defying everything that they should be. These, these rigid walls are morphing and um, moving in ways that we don't expect. And in this, in this work and, and recently, I've really kind of amped up that material confusion um, and material play that's part of my work. Uh, so instead of using those polychrome colors, I'm really you know, pulling on this faux marble, uh, this faux marble thing to kind of add another layer of, uh, of material questioning. So this is my most recent project uh, at the Jacordova Museum outside Boston. Uh, so those pieces that I showed you are about 180 pounds. So I can kind of move them over carefully, like flip them on my own or carry them lumberingly with a studio assistant. And uh, Sam Adams, the curator at the Jacordova Museum approached me about really supersizing that work for an outdoor public sculpture. And uh, that, in so many ways, that required a total rethinking about how I approach this work. And you can see that stone really coming into play here again. And also that, that figural sense. I really wanted to see if I could pull in the figuration that I was getting with those vertical pieces, but be, use the, the metal plinth. And it's got some really great relationships with other pieces in the park. Um, I love that, that stone, staring at the stone down the field. And so that particular pose, instead of coming from sort of my psyche and my own body and more of a self-portraity type of approach, was really a much more research-based piece and it was drawing on this common trope of the female nude that we've all seen for hundreds of years throughout art history. It, male painters painting naked women, um, often imagining what these sort of uh, harem sex workers would be like, um, never having been to the Turkish harems where they are imagining them. Um, and that's definitely the case with um, Manet's Olympia. Um, and I really, for this piece, was looking a lot at this Fuseli painting, The Nightmare. Um, so you can see she's sort of arched impossibly, just like the concrete folds over the chaise lounge with her nightgown clinging to her. And she's got this incubus, this sort of demon of the night sitting on her chest, um, which is supposed to be symbolic of um, nightmares and bad dreams that um, you know, visit women who would do some some sort of thing to invite them, of course, right? Some some behavior to invite this male uh, demon to sit on your chest. And of course, you can see the relationship between that work and this piece. But instead of having the sort of unconscious woman flayed back over a chair, I wanted to create a much more active sculpture um, that could kind of stand in for all bodies. It has that suggestive, um, pose that's aligned with these female nudes, but it doesn't have any sexualized parts. It's not really a gendered object. It's sort of standing in for all bodies and kind of pushing against this stone, which is weighing it down. So let me talk a little bit about this process. Um, you saw the process for the smaller pieces. The larger piece um, was a much more involved process and much more expensive. Um, you know, I think working at that scale the scary part of it is that you really only get one shot. Um, you can't really mess it up. Uh, so uh, what I did for this work, um, you can see on the left, I made a clay model, that tan form that you're seeing. I can actually show that to you. I've got it right here. 
Um, so um, I did that and then I worked with um, a special effects team, a um, cinematic special effects team. They 3D scanned that object and then extruded it and 3D printed it, which is the gray form that you're seeing there. So we could really see how it was going to operate at scale and with its base and kind of smooth out all of the hand um, done little chunks and divots that you see in the tan form. And then we had to make a mold. So like the smaller scale pieces, um, you've got this humongous mold. So we made a big blank, uh, a big rectangular blank, and then made a rubber mold of it. The mold weighs like 150 pounds. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty insane. Um, and then we used a CNC router to create this grid, which you're seeing on the bottom, to create the mold form. When I'm in my studio, you saw I throw everything but the kitchen sink at, at it. I've got moving blankets and foam and that weird piece of wood, and I just make it work to get the form that I want. Obviously, with 2,000 pounds of concrete, I wasn't going to be able to move anything once we started loading it. And we had to get it right, it had to be perfect. And so using that 3D scanning technique, we were able to CNC cut this grid to form the mold bed or the bed that she was gonna lay on. And this again, you're looking at the back side of her. And there's that goopy process um, where I'm taking dyed concrete, um, it's pre-dyed, I had all these containers and creating that swirly form and not really knowing what it's gonna look like, but really hoping it's good because I only get one shot. So we let that hang out for uh, several days so the concrete could reach its hardness. And of course we had intelligently put our um, lifting straps underneath before we cast it um, and then lifted, it, lifted up this 2000 pound babe. And there she was once we flipped her over and I was sitting in the place of the stone. So you can really get the sense of scale with this, um, with this process pick. Okay, so I said I was gonna talk more about stones. Um, so let me, talk about, um, let me talk about them a little bit more. So you saw in that piece of the decor of a museum, uh, the stone really functioning as this kind of masculine oppressive burden um, and that is not just me kind of loading that symbology into that material. It has a long history. This is a representation of Sisyphus rolling his stone up the hill. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Greek mythology, the, the short version is that the gods were mad at him and they condemned Sisyphus to roll this stone up a hill for the rest of his life. But of course, once he reached the top and the pinnacle and he completed his task, the stone would roll back down and he'd have to do it again. Um, so in the myth of Sisyphus, Sisyphus Camus kind of speaks about the absurdity of this um, and how that mimics our lives. So in this other body of work, these installations, which Michelle referred to when she introduced me, um, I am really exploring the, the potential in this material. So this work um, was created for a hotel uh, and was based on work that um, I actually did in graduate school uh, where I, in, in that case, I had used granite. In this case, I'm using obsidian and hand wrapped in this very methodical, real, ritualistic way, all of these boulders and tethered them to this uh, plywood surface. So they create this illusion of this kind of textile flowing form, not unlike the folds, uh, that is kind of barely held together. And, and the work really, started to move into this environmental place also where you know it was talking about the fragility of our environment but also the human impact on it the human desire to kind of hold it all together so speaking of being resourceful um you know i had all of these boulders delivered to me um you know it's like how do you gosh i gotta search google how do you buy rocks in bulk um <laughs> And so um, I, you know, it's very carefully specified on the phone with these guys. Let's go. Like, oh, I need these rocks to be, you know, basketball size, head size, so that I can lift them. You know, I need to be able to lift each one on my own. Um, but what I got were um, some rocks that were humongous and like 400 pounds each that didn't fit through the door of my studio because the pallets were too wide. So I had to have them re-delivered to this Brooklyn storage unit where I um, broke them down, hand chiseled them and hand drilled them down into the boulders that you just saw in August in a windowless room. So 
lessons learned, but you can always figure out a way. That's the lesson that I learned. <laughs> and so each one um, was, you know, tethered with this rope and secured with a cable. And then they were all numbered and labeled. So I basically built that puzzle in my studio and then labeled every single rock, you know, like A56, A57, and then put them all in these bins and then rebuilt the sculpture on site. So I didn't have to do all of the Tetrising of how everything fit together while I was actually installing. So uh, Michelle talked about the uh, Kyrgyzstan piece. And um, of course that, that work that I just shared at one hotel sort of has this mountainous, um, quality to it and really kind of explores this human impact on the landscape and really conceptually gets at our human desire to kind of control and shape the land. Um, and when I was invited to create an installation for the U.S. Embassy in Kyrgyzstan, I did a lot of research into, you know, what is this place and what, what is the culture and what's important to these folks? Because of course an embassy is a place of cultural exchange. Um, and I really wanted to, the work to hold that power and create that space for that exchange. Um, and Kyrgyzstan uh, is known for its natural beauty, these incredible mountains, and also its nomadic people that live outside in these incredible yurt structures. Um, and have this really cool felting tradition where they make all these these handmade felts and so i worked those colors and those mountains into the artwork that i ultimately created for the space so this piece had 36 panels that kind of followed the topographical shape of the mountain range uh, that was right outside the window so you can't see that in this image I was not allowed to take any pictures of exits or entrances or any of that very tight security at the u.s embassy um, and each of those panels was done in, in this case in the first iteration of this topography's work in this very analog way where i was tracing a map and then turning it into these drawings and I had a 400 square foot studio in Brooklyn. Um, it was a subsidized space, which is not enough room to create a 72 foot long sculpture, um, but we made it work. And I hand bent all of these um, aluminum pieces and had them powder coated and then attached, sewing by hand every single rope. Um, it, it took a really long time. And there's one of my first assistants ever in my Brooklyn studio. We had these all strung up and created them on the floor so that we could have enough space since I only had nine foot high ceilings. And that was the result. And it really was taking into account the structure of the space. You can see on the left, all these windows, people could view this from below, from the side. And then all of these side offices had very specific views through the slices of the artwork. And so as I was conceiving it, I was really thinking about all of the different ways in which people were gonna be able to interact with it. So we had to build the scaffolding to get up this high, which was a surprise to us when we arrived and we were working under this drop ceiling, crouched for nine days. Um, and here's a picture of the team that deinstalled the scaffolding on the night before we had to leave. And we were hanging out on the scaffolding to make sure that the artwork didn't get destroyed in the process at two in the morning. It was pretty intense. And there we are kind of debagging it and straightening all of the ropes before we had to get on a flight that night. I was really cutting it down to the wire. Rachel, that's so amazing that you got to go there and like hang it yourself. And did you get to experience, sorry to like segue, but did you get to experience at all? Like the country, did you get to go out into <laughs> outside of the embassy? One, we had one afternoon um, while we were waiting for the scaffolding to, you know, to be taken down. Um, and, you know, that afternoon they were recording a video about the work and the person who interviewed me was like, so what's your favorite part of Kyrgyzstan? And of course I hadn't slept in nine days and it literally is on the antipodes of the globe from where I was. So I was totally jet lagged, just like a 12 hour difference. And I like almost burst into tears. I was like, I don't know, I've only seen the inside of this stupid embassy. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we barely got to explore the country, but the lesson I learned there was just, you know, always leave more time than you think you need, um, because something will always come up, and that is, like, definitely the um, sort of take home of large scale work. Something unexpected always arises. How are we doing on time? Um, I think we have about 10 minutes or so left for your lecture if we want to do um, the studio tour as Sounds well. Sounds good. 
Okay, perfect. So I will show you the piece that was made manifest from this map of Mount Rainier, um, which ended up in the Airbnb lobby. So I translated that map like the previous map into a bunch of data points represented in rope. Um, and uh, here we have a studio assistant in Brooklyn who is perfectly matching the art uh, and helping to attach and glue together every single one. Uh, there were a total of, I think it was, uh, I want to say it was 3,600 ropes. Um, that all needed to be measured and attached and you can see all the completed panels uh, next to her it, it was a lot um, and, and I kind of joke that this project took like two months off my life uh, it was really it, it's a lot of repetitive work um, and this is us installing it so if I thought that the um, embassy installation was hard this one was even harder because this floor that you're seeing wasn't load bearing so we couldn't just pop a lift on there and go straight up as one would like to do um, we had to have a, um, a professional rigger build this grid for us um, and then we had to all of the channels had little hooks on the top and we had to push them out into this void and of course as the grid got loaded with more and more weight we had more and more deflection in the cable so it was bending inwards and getting farther and farther away from us as we were reaching out over this cantilevered scaffolding which is just a scaffolding with literally a bunch of steel on the back so that it doesn't tip over um, into the void so there we go sending the artwork over the edge um, and of course, it, you, you can't get it back after you put it out. So you really have to make sure it's right. You can do the old hook on a stick technique and pull it back. But aside from that um, very analog tool, it was um, sort of a you know, one shot uh, and you're done element. And this is it finally installed. Um, I am really happy with this piece and it, you know, I thought it was a really excellent continuation of the work that I did for the embassy and I recently completed a piece uh, for the University of Washington and the Gates Foundation in Seattle which is an even bigger version of this piece my largest work to date um, so uh, if you stay tuned to my website and my Instagram that'll appear there eventually soon so you know this this work I think is interesting in that it really um, it really gets at the um, sort of diaphanousness um, of, of the landscape and really kind of shows it as this um, rigid boundary that's also really kind of flexible and malleable. And I think it also looks incredibly digitized. I mean, it almost looks fake from this viewpoint. And the shadows are really cool. Um, I get the opportunity to work with a lot of lighting specialists to light my work. And so um, I was really excited about the interplay of the shadows on this uh, non load bearing floor that that was its one use. <laughs> yeah, so you can see, you know, you can look straight through these slices to the other side of the room. And then I've also adapted that work to flat walls. Um, so this work is called Eroded Topography, so it's for Facebook's, uh, one of Facebook's offices in Lower Manhattan. Uh, and as we have probably read and heard, um, you know, Manhattan will soon be underwater. Um, and so that, that coastline is eroding. So this was a way to, you know, both um, immortalize it, but also kind of speak to human in, impact on the land. And I also love how it kind of doubles as fire. Uh, I think that's a, that's a cool thing. And I'll just share some architectural projects and kind of finish on the, um, the Pittsburgh airport installation. Um, in addition to these topography series, I've also created this series of arches. So it's again, kind of pulling on my weaving vocabulary, trying to create these rigid looking masses out of material that is inherently soft. And it's really just kind of measuring those ropes and that is what they are um, to very precise measurements that allows the artwork to have this illusion of being uh, sort of spherical. And as you pass under this artwork, you, um, well, first of all, you see this moiré effect. You can see those patterns that are created by the overlapping ropes. 
Now, as you pass under it, there's this illusion of a weaving that's kind of created um, as, the, as the ropes overlap and crisscross in space, as you can see in this piece, inverted arches in gold. So I'm really drawing on that architectural language of the classical architecture, a strong form, one of the strongest forms um, that is really sapped of its strength by being inverted and kind of suspended limp in, you know, in one of these big glass towers that is now New York. And this is the process of making it, is really just hoping your studio is big enough to accommodate it. <laughs> um, so, you know, everything gets measured and hung in here um, and then folds it up and taken to the site. So this is a rendering of the piece that I ultimately created for the uh, Pittsburgh airport, you can see these tight arches in the skylight and these more open arches in these bulkheads. And I, the, the airport is soon going to be um, completely remodeled. And so I really wanted to pay homage to and kind of replicate this architecture, which is gonna soon be destroyed and which has been the Pittsburgh airport for decades. So, you know, it started with me not knowing what I was doing and kind of creating this um, grid drawing which was translated into a CAD model by um, Wheaton and Sons, the incredible metal fabricator that helped to create this artwork. Um, and ultimately it was these four quadrants that we built in the studio and you know, had no room to walk. And this is the Pittsburgh studio, which I'm about to show you. And there it is installed. Um, and this piece is recto verso. It's really examining these arches from, you know, upside down, right side up, left, right, um, kind of turning them in space like a page. And that's just one of the pairings that you can see. And then I just will, I'll brief you, briefly show you what I'm doing now. Um, I I'm taking those folds, those cast concrete pieces and um, working on them in cast foam um, so that it's not 180 pounds. Um, and I'm really playing with that, you know, that interplay of the flowability of fabric and the rigidity of these forms. And then I'm also really pushing into this new material um, chain, which is loaded with a lot of this same symbolism and uses as rope is. Um, and I started stone carving. So this is uh, some alabaster chain that I carved by hand. And then this um, monster cast urethane plastic chain. Um, and I'll show you some of the molds for that piece. This is hanging behind me, you can see, but it's against the wall and doesn't have the same luminescence um, as it does here or as it does in Michelle's beautiful background. So I thought I'd share um, these images of it. And I can talk a little bit more about um, how this work is made and kind of where it's conceptually going. And I will just leave that there in case you want to leave, in case you want to learn more or get in touch. Thanks. That's all for that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was incredible. Um, your work is just so epic and like, it's just gotten more epic. I feel like over the years, um, I love hearing these stories about like you, you know, kind of struggling in your studio and your spaces and with these materials. And I know you're a fairly tiny person. So like imagining you hauling these like huge rocks and like, you know, these huge concrete sculptures around. I mean, I know you can totally and you do handle it really well, but I can't even imagine like, you know, dealing with all of that materiality and like, you know, there's just so much. And I, I just love that you're just going for it, you know every time yeah i feel like i'm always like pushing the bounds of the container i'm in i mean i have been able to kind of grow my studio size over the years and then i always feel like i am you know stacking things on top of things and into every nook and cranny and just you know then the studio is never big enough to make the next humongous thing i want to make but you know that's my own my own struggle to deal with you just have to get another studio <laughs> with five more studios yeah yeah um, cool. So I think at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to try to seamlessly transition into um, the studio tour. So Rachel's going to um, use her phone for that. So she's going to drop out of um, the call as she is right now and kind of enter back in. So we'll hopefully have a seamless kind of um, transition into that. So just give us a minute here.
I have to unmute you, Rachel. Hold on one second. Okay, you should be good. Okay, great. How do I sound everyone? Good. Okay. Um, all right, great. Well, I will try to not um, make you guys nauseous as I take you around the studio. Um, let me give you a brief little tour of where we even are. So yeah, this is this is it right now. I have to say it's sort of chock full of things and massive rocks. Um, but yeah, this is this is it. Why don't I start with this green chain since that is the last thing that we were looking at and I can just give you an up close and personal view of it and give you a sense of scale with my hand here. So this work is uh, created from these concentric links and you can see they are uh, it's glued together in the middle with these pins uh, and the gradient sort of changes across them and then they're held together with these um, with these chains and I'll show you how those are created and feel free anybody who wants to kind of jump in with any questions we're kind of merging the studio tour with the Q&A um, so if you have any questions for Rachel as she's going around feel free to to ask Yes, please. Um, yeah, so these start out with this, um, you know, graph paper template, which then gets um, translated into these, um, these foam blocks, which are hand carved. This is just like, you know, kind of cheapy art foam. You can buy it on Amazon or, you know, whatever um, mega conglomerate you'd like to support. Um, <laughs> Um, and then ultimately these get uh, translated into this, this floppy silicone mold. So every time I cast, I can create one, uh, you know, one closed link and one empty link. And ultimately um, they become this piece that you see hanging out on the wall right here. Uh, and that is, I mean, that's a mold making tutorial for you right there. Just, you know, your basic kind of positive object and creating a mold that is a negative of that object so you can then recreate the positive in whatever material you want. I also can show you some of these folds. Um, this one you did not see. It is on this uh, dolly so that it can move around easily in the studio. But this is one of the early pieces and I love that you can sort of see daylight through here. It kind of perches. Uh, Rachel, I, I love how like uh, your sculptures have taken on such a figurative, um, you know, kind of content and meaning uh, over the years. I feel like, I think you were always kind of in that mentality, but I feel like it's becoming a lot more obvious in, in a lot of ways. And I think adding in color obviously um, is, is helping with that. Um, but I, I really, I really love that approach and I love that idea and making them yeah. the same size as you. It's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's, you know, scale is a tool that I use a lot to, um, to my advantage and a lot of the, you know, work is either exactly my size and the goal is that it can help viewers to relate to the work and kind of see their own bodies in it or, you know, the work is references the body, but it's like so outsized that it kind of brings a level of absurdity to it. I mean, like that green chain, there's sort of this, it's sort of the necklace for a giant almost, yeah. you know, or with the installations, they're so big that they, um, they really make the viewer feel small and vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, there's also kind of a sense of humor, mm -hmm. I feel like with the, with the uh, folded pieces that I haven't really seen in your work before either. Yeah. So I think that's kind of great. In some of them, I mean, I think in those pieces, I'll show you the most recent ones, which I, I struggle with that. I feel like I'm a very serious person and my art is that way as well. Um, here's a piece that I did not share. And this is the most recent version um, titled The Bow. Uh, and it's got this, you know, very, I mean, this, this is my quarantine piece. You know, this is my 2020 piece. Um, it really very much is like a sculpture for our time. And I, um, you know, there's a little bit of material fakery going on here in that, you know, I have this 
stone kind of nestled perfectly in that space but I'll I'll show you guys the secret um, if I can it is you can so you can't even really see the hardware back there um, yeah it's pretty good you can kind of see in there um, that it uh, it's attached with a um, with a rod but uh, I'm, I'm really interested in that material fakery and here is the piece that um, one of the pieces I shared with you titled the exchange I love this and, one. It you know, feels this, like a, this work really feels like a double portrait. I, I love this work too. And it was really challenging to create. And I really had to kind of think about, um, I, I really had to <laughs> challenge myself to think about it differently. Um, you know, when I was making it, I had these forms that I wanted them to be. And then when I demolded them, they didn't look right at all and my poor assistants were probably ready to kill me because I was like, can we see that upside down? Let's try it the other way again. <laughs> I felt so bad. Um, but you know, and both of these pieces actually are upside down from what they were intended to be. So that's like a common, I feel like that's a common art trick. Um, at least if you're working abstractly, it's like, let's just see what it looks like upside down. Most of the time it's better. Um, but <laughs> But it, I, you know, I think my work does require, or you know, I I have tried to think more flexibly about things in that way. And the beauty of having time in the studio and not working on a deadline is that you really can um, kind of play with things in that way and like let them tell you what they want to be. Um, but I'll show you that so that those rock that rock piece that I shared with you in one hotel, there was another iteration which I didn't share today, and this is it. I mean. There it is. This is my whole studio. It's just covered in rocks um, of different sizes. I've separated out my favorite rocks. Um, but yeah, it's kind of crazy. They are everywhere. And I'm, you know, looking desperately for a home for this because it's taking up valuable real estate here right now. Um, I love like I've actually talked to Justin Hoover a bit because he's been um, curating here at Disjecta. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, um, I have a whole closet that's just full of Rachel's rocks. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> He, yeah, I, I think he's going to reinstall them outside, but I, that is the, I mean, that's the difficulty of I, just sculpture in general. I gripe about this with my lady sculptor friends all the time. I mean, the mass and the size and just the logistics of moving things. I mean, it's not like, oh, just bring your work to the gallery. Let me just put my paintings under my arm and walk there. It's like, oh, we need a pallet jack and a crane and a crater. And then it's this whole sort of expense and process and this is whole other layer of how you have to think about things, you know, because like that to part of a piece, you have to think about how you're going to move it before you even make it. You know, you have to put the straps underneath it before you even make it so that you can lift it. And it's that kind of logistical thinking, which, um, yeah, it just, it's a lot. Um, and so, and so I have been working small. Um, I'll show you the smallest thing I ever made. It's so tiny. I um, love these pieces. These hands are so just like ethereal and really fragile and kind of sweet and feminine. And yeah, I love them. It's, yeah, it's even smaller than my actual hand. Well, thank wow. you. So this is one, the second thing I ever carved. Um, and this is like a deconstructed chainmail glove that's sort of dripping off of it but um this has really been very new for me in that i you know even though i'm referencing the body abstractly in a lot of my work i'm not um show you another one um i i'm not really uh referencing the body directly or representationally and so you know and a lot of that abstract references so that i can talk about, um, you know, sort of barriers and boundaries around the body or around, you know, our personhood. And so, um, you know, this is a much more direct way to, to work. And I hope still kind of leave something open um, for the viewer to add. I hope they're not terribly direct. Um, but that blue alabaster piece, I mean, this is how it comes. This is, this is it. And then, you know, by carving it, um, you know, you end up somewhere like this. Um, this is the most recent carving. She's got nails. Um, <laughs> she sure does. Yeah. Yeah. This is very witchy. Um, yeah. I really like this piece. And it's also, it's got this translucency to it, which I think you can see as I'm holding it up to the light, which I really like. It, ha it almost has these veins of, you know, these human veins in it. Um, and then of course I've been playing with flocking too. So here's a flocked rock, of course. Just one more rock in my studio. Um, so yeah, that that is what I have been working on largely. Um, 
I can show can show you guys the molds that the folds are from. But then af after that, I really I would love to take questions, and I can show you other stuff in the studio uh, if you'd like. Just take you guys over here. I <laughs> this is it. It's not that exciting, but you can see what it looks like. You know, that's the mold right now. It's got a piece of uh, insulation foam in there to keep its shape so it doesn't get too floppy. Um, but but that's it. It's um, pretty gross rubber. And I've got another another chain mold here that I've been working on of um, small chains also. Um, but yeah, and those start out, like I said, there are these, all of these, these uh, foam forms that I carve. So I think that, that that should give a good sense of things, but I would love to take your questions and maybe they're really not about my work and maybe they're about being an artist or life or whatever you guys feel like asking. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? I saw Jeffrey Sanko is here. Hey, hey. Hi. 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 How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. This is so wonderful. It's so great to, I just follow Rachel on Instagram all the time and it's just incredible to see the behind the scenes uh, stuff. But I guess I'm really curious about the Airbnb. What what was that non-load bearing floor? Like what was that floor to begin with? <laughs> um, they basically put drywall over this, it, this atrium. It was a glass, atrium lid that allowed people to see into the unit below, which was not Airbnb's space. So instead of actually building a real floor, they just did that um, and had this big open kind of non-functional space. But of course that created a space for me to, to actually make some artwork. It's and amazing. then follow up real quick, do you have um, any liability things that you go through when you're doing gigantic installations like insurances and stuff? Um, I have a general, I have a um, general liability policy that is, covers me, you know, it's a, like $2 million of insurance, which isn't that expensive, by the way, um, and a good thing for, for folks to have. I mean, that's required for most of these installations. I have, knock on wood, never had to use it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming, Jeffrey. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Any students? Um, feel free to use the chat um, function too if you feel uncomfortable uh, asking auditorily. Um, someone wrote in the chat that they um, that they it makes them want to try working with different types of materials instead of just pencil and paper. And I would say that I strongly encourage that. Um, I think um, I think when you're in school and you're working with a limited budget, it is really hard to give yourself permission to make experiments um and i also have trouble with that because there's so, so much time which is limited and resources that go into it and so if you fail you know whatever that looks like and sometimes a, a failure is not really a failure but you know it, it feels really hard um but in every like in every great and successful piece of art there are probably at least five quote unquote failures behind it. Um, but I have learned so much from things that have gone wrong. And, um, and oftentimes when things go wrong as and they don't go the way I intended, I often get something even better than what I was trying for. Um, and by being able to actually like look and embrace, look at and embrace my, um, my quote unquote failures, I can often get to new techniques and um, even more exciting places. So um, yeah, I would say experiment because um, that's where really cool, fun accidents happen. And I'm seeing all of these messages that they, people were happy and excited and inspired and that makes me so, um, so happy too. So thank you for the kind words everyone and thank you for tuning in. Um, I think, other questions? Yeah, I think Ariel um, had her hand raised and then uh, Madison also has a question. So let's go to Ariel first. Sure. Um, maybe I missed it. Um, the piece, the largest piece that you've made, the one that was 
I guess based, based on Mount Rainier. Um, what was that made out of again? Oh, that, so that's rope. It's, it's, I don't think I said um, specifically, so sorry about that. Yeah, that's, um, it's nylon rope and you can see um, that I have, I'm a rope queen. Um, I mean, I have rope like stored everywhere in my studio. Um, and there's like, you know, you can see rope back there, those gold bags. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's what that is. It's quarter inch nylon rope. And I work with a dyer in Long Island City to kind of get colors matched just right. Cool. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Great. And then um, Madison has a question in the chat and um, asked, how do you find a starting place with inspiration and motivation for beginning pieces? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think I'm always interested in borders and boundaries and, and restriction in those relationships. Um, you know, for the large scale work, um, a lot of it is through site visits. You know, I, most of these places, I have the opportunity to go there and visit and kind of be in the space before I propose an idea for it. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes the location, like you saw with the Bishkek embassy piece in Kyrgyzstan or the Airbnb piece, like the actual locale and the geography is inspiring the work. Um, and for the sculptures that I'm making in my studio, I think those are much more kind of about giving form to um, psychological spaces. And so I think those come from a much more internal place. But oftentimes it's really just being open to looking and just seeing like the strangest things in your environment and being open and receptive to them. And it kind of kicks off this idea. I often have, I, I know this sounds cliche and weird, but I often have like visions that come to me um, that, you know, I, I will see a sculpture like fully formed. I mean like this green chain, was that way. And sometimes you know, when that vision is really strong, you know you have to make it. You know, most of the time it's like before I'm going to sleep. And then I'm like, oh, fine, I'll get out of bed and I'll put that in the sketchbook. I totally do that too, Rachel, it's so funny. Like, it's usually in the middle of the night. Like, I usually like have a dream, I wake up and I'm like, oh, I have to make this thing. Um, and sometimes yeah. it's strong enough that I have to write down the idea and get up and do it. But, um, and then other times I'm like, eh, I'll remember in the morning and then I don't, but. I love that. Well, right. It's like, why can't the muse just visit at a convenient time? Right. <laughs> right. Um, I think last, maybe last question. Um, anybody want to add anything? It looks like um, Valeria says, is there any way I can get a copy of your PowerPoint? Yeah. Yes. I okay. will send. So as you know, this Zoom was recorded. Um, so you can see that. I'm sure that Michelle um, can provide that. And then I will also send um, the power. I'll put in a Google Drive the PowerPoint um, so that Michelle can see it. But the best way really to learn about my work is to go to my website because everything is there and there's much more comprehensive information about what everything's made of and how big it is and what year it was made. Um, so, and that's just uh, my name. It's rachelmicaweiss.com. Perfect. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us, Rachel. This has been incredible. Thank you for taking time thank out of your so day. Much. And yeah, um, thanks uh, to everybody else for coming and for the great questions. Um, again, um, if you want to check out um, our programming, you can go to archergallery.space and find out more about Art Talks. Um, if you want to find out more about Rachel's work, you can go to her website, which is Rachel. Rachel Rachel, that's really great. RachelMicaWeiss.com. <laughs> um, so um, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me, email me, etc. Um, and otherwise, um, we'll see you all next time. Um, we're going to have another art talk on Friday at noon. So um, Zoom links are posted to the website. So thanks again, Rachel. And um, thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you, and Michelle. We'll, we'll see you next time. Yes, thank you everyone for the enthusiastic, kind words. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.